Good evening. evening. Welcome to our Lord's house. Tonight we celebrate the Lutheran Reformation, and one of the great rediscoveries of the Reformation was the difference between two important teachings of the Bible, the law and the gospel. So that's the biblical pair that we focus on tonight, law and gospel. We'll begin with our first hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. (coughs) Blessings on your worship tonight. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, We have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. 
We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Daniel 6. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. The word of the Lord. Be Please stand. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, then a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We continue with our next hymn, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word.
A good handyman is going to have more than one tool in their toolbox, right? Going to have a hammer, going to have a screwdriver, going to have other things too. But he's not just going to have more than one tool, he's also going to know how and when to use each of them. He wouldn't be a very good handyman if he tries to use the hammer to do the job of the screwdriver and, and vice versa. It's important for him to know what tool to pick for, for what job. God has given us more than one tool in the toolbox of his word. He's given us the law and he's given us the gospel. And not only is it good for us to have them, but it's good for us to know how and when to use each of these tools. We wouldn't be handling God's word rightly if we tried to use the law to do the job of the gospel and vice versa. It's important for us to know how to pick the right tool for the right job. Our second reading from before helps us with this. Tells us more about the law. Tells us more about the gospel so that we can know more about what they each are and what they do for us. Um, first with the law. The law is when God tells us what we should do and what we shouldn't do, right? Think of the Ten Commandments. You shall, you shall, you shall. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. And why does God give us the law? The effect of the law, like we read before, is that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. When God tells us what we are supposed to do, we are accountable to him to do it. And that ends up silencing us. Because when God holds us accountable for what we've done, that law is condemning us for breaking the law. And there's nothing we can say in response to that, because we have broken the law. The goal of all this, the goal of God giving the law is that through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law is like a mirror that God uses to show us our self, to show us our sinfulness. And this is a good and useful thing about the law, right? We are so sinful that sometimes we need someone to show us how sinful we are. Sometimes we need someone to show us how big of a deal our sin is. And the law does that for us. God uses the law to show us our sin. But as helpful as it is for us, it also shows us a limitation that the law has. The law is not going to be able to save us. The law is not going to be able to make us right with God because every time we compare ourselves against that law, it just makes us more conscious of our sin. It just reveals us to be lawbreakers. So we use the law rightly when we use it to learn what's right and wrong. We use the law rightly when we use it to know how we should live. We also use the law rightly when we use it as that mirror to show us our sinfulness, to show us our need for a Savior. But what happens if we try to use the law for something else? What happens if we try to use the law as our way to be saved? What happens if we try to use the law as the thing that's going to make us right with God. Well, if we try to use the law for something it's not designed for, it's going to end up in one of two things. It's going to bring us either into self-righteous pride or it's going to bring us into despair. If we try to use the tool of God's law as our way to be saved by telling ourselves, well, we're keeping God's law, we're doing good enough, at some point, we end up trusting ourself, right? We end up making ourself to be our savior instead of Jesus. That's self-righteous pride. Or, if when we're looking at the law, we realize we haven't kept it well enough, that can start to just eat away at us more and more as we realize we're not good enough in who we are, that we deserve God's punishment for breaking the law that can bring us into despair. And you know, with today being the day we're celebrating the Reformation, we're thinking of what God did in bringing the truth to light for Martin Luther. And before Martin Luther knew more of God's word, he experienced that kind of despair because people were pointing him to the law as the way for him to be saved. 
the church of his day was, was pointing to the law and saying, that's at least part of the way to be right with God, which just had Luther feeling worse and worse because he knew he had broken that law. That was despair. For you, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know which of the, the, the bad uses of the law end up being the greater danger. If you're more likely to go into self-righteous pride thinking you're doing such a good job of keeping the law, or if you're more likely to go into despair realizing that you haven't. Or maybe a bounce back and forth between the two. But either one of those is not a place we want to be. And that's why it's important for us to not use the tool of God's law for something it was never designed to do. God's law shows us how to live. God's law shows us our sinfulness. It shows us our need for a savior. But the law cannot save us or make us right with God. The second tool that God has for us in the toolbox of his word is the gospel. The word gospel means good news. The gospel is the good news of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus. And our reading before told us more about this gospel good news and, and what it is, what it does. It said, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. There are some words in there that are packed with a lot of meaning to show us what that gospel gives us. It says sacrifice of atonement. On the cross, Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins against God's law. And he's a sacrifice of atonement, at one mint. Jesus took people like us who were far separated from God because of our sin, and he brought us back to God. He made us at one with God. It says redemption. Jesus redeemed us. He bought us. We were slaves to sin because we sinned against God's law. But Jesus, by his blood for us, paid off our debt and bought us back for himself. Justified freely by his grace, Jesus justifies us. He causes us to have that not guilty verdict in God's courtroom because Jesus has taken all our sin away and he's given us his own innocence. And all of this comes completely free to us by God's grace without us doing anything to earn it. Righteousness is given through faith. We have this right status with God, not by our works, not by the things that we do, but solely by faith, solely by trust in our Savior Jesus. All this is the good news that God has for us in the gospel. And again, since we're celebrating the Reformation, we're, we're thanking God for the fact that he brought this gospel truth clearly to light for Martin Luther and through Luther brought it clearly to light for us still now today. But think of, think of what it would have been like to not know that, to not know that gospel clearly. And think of that how great it would be to learn it. Think of how great it was to discover that God gives righteousness by faith, that God justifies for free, that Christ redeemed us fully, that Christ sacrificed himself to put us at one with God. This was great news to learn, and it is still great news for us now. So what do we do with great news like that? What's the right way to use this tool of God's gospel? It's simply to trust it. That's the way you use news, right? News isn't something that you do. It's not something you have to follow. Good news is simply something you trust, simply something you believe. God's good news, God's gospel is something for us simply to tr trust. God has done everything to save us, forgiving, justifying, atoning, redeeming. He's done it all. And through that gospel, his spirit works in our hearts, the faith that trusts it. So is there a wrong way to use the gospel? There is. 
If God's gospel good news is simply good news for us to trust, it's not something we have to do, then it's not a law. It's not something that tells us how we should live. Unfortunately, though, sometimes people do fall into that. They start thinking, okay, well, God loves me, he forgives me, that means I can just sin as much as I want, I can do whatever I want, who cares, it's all fine. And we know that thought process ourselves, don't we? Because there have been times where we've looked to God's love and forgiveness as if that were licensed for us to do whatever sinful thing we wanted to do. But that's not what the gospel is. That's not what the tool of the gospel does. The gospel doesn't tell us how to live. The law tells us that. The gospel simply tells us what Jesus has done to save us. That's what the gospel does. It's good news. Good news simply for us to trust. Law and gospel are the two tools that God has for us in the toolbox of his word. And they're both good and helpful tools. They're both good and useful things for us to have. It's not like one of them's good and the other one's bad. It's not like one of them's the old way from the Old Testament and the other's the new way from the New Testament. They're different tools for different jobs, but through both of them, God accomplishes his purposes in us. With the law, he shows us how to live. With the law, he shows us our sinfulness. He shows us our need for a savior. With the gospel, God shows us our savior, Jesus. He shows us the forgiveness, the righteousness, the justification, the redemption, the sacrifice, the atonement found in him. So, as heirs of the Lutheran Reformation, let's keep using these two tools of law and gospel the right way. And let's always be in God's word where God himself uses these tools on our hearts. Amen. Please stand. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Almighty and eternal God, when the set time had come, you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to take our place under the demands of the law and endure the just punishment for our sins. You raised him from death in glorious splendor, and for his sake you richly and daily forgive sins. When the set time had come, you poured out your spirit on your people and called them to proclaim the gospel to every creature. Equipped and encouraged, they carried the story of salvation to all the world. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Blessed is its shores rejoice. When the set time had come, you raised up your servant Martin Luther to destroy the idols of the medieval age and to restore the pure teaching of the scriptures. You granted power and success to the proclamation of the gospel, and your holy church grew and prospered throughout the world. When the set time had come, you made our fathers bold to take their stand on the truth of your word. Guided by your spirit, they joined hands and hearts under a shared confession and with a determined resolve to work together in the ministry. 
You have blessed their sons and daughters and enabled us to preserve and proclaim the saving gospel of your Son. Let this be the time when you renew us again by word and sacrament, when you reform our hearts and minds, and when you restore to us the joy of fellowship and service. Grant to us in this age and in this place the courage of the apostles, the steadfastness of the reformers, and the dedication of the fathers of our church's past. Let this be a time to imitate the kind-hearted souls in our church who served the sick, helped the disabled, cared for the abandoned, and comforted the dying. Provide occasions to serve them and times to pray for them. Keep all your children in your powerful and gracious care. Let this be a time when we recommit ourselves to the ministry of the gospel of your Son. Let us find joy in our unity, zeal for our work, and if it is your will, success in our labor. And give us faith to take up again the trumpet none can silence or mistake, and grant us courage to proclaim once more for all the world to hear, the feast is ready, come to the feast. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Let this time and all our times be used to give thanks for your grace in Christ and to praise you for calling us into your mission to save. We continue with our next hymn.
please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn. services 
and I'd probably be able to get the other passers from the rotation to take turns coming up for that. I don't know what that means as far as as far as catechism. So I didn't give a schedule all past Christmas because I don't I don't know for that yet. But that might be a reason to have the Thursday services again when we get to Lent. But um, right. so in between think, Christmas and Lent is what we're asking. Well, there's been tasked by council to come up with an idea, and we would probably know from what I'm hearing is have. Uh, Lenten services on Thursday instead of Wednesday, and we'd, we'd basically be returning to our Thursday service, except instead of it being a Sunday service, it would be a Lenten service once we get to February 14th. So that's what we're thinking. We haven't made any decisions. We're starting just starting to talk about Eric Wolf is the other elder. So if you have any strong feelings about it or a better idea, come and talk to us in the next few weeks and my two minutes are up. <laughs>